So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to Dublin. Um, first, I want to say a big thank you to Databricks and the Spark community and all of you for the chance to speak. Um, so in the next sort of few slides, I'm hopefully going to talk about the journey we've been through at Hotels.com over the last two and a half years, some of the technology we're using, and a little bit of some of the use cases that I'm very excited about. Uh, and catch me later for questions if you have any. So to start off with, um, is this working? It'll come in a second. So um, just briefly, the first quick uh, corporate slide. So Hotels.com is part of the Expedia Inc. family. And the crucial thing is we have um, over 30 million loyal customers in our loyalty program. We have millions and millions, tens of millions of reviews, tens, hundreds of thousands of properties, and we're making billions of predictions every day. Uh, so it's a huge scale challenge both now and very much in the future. You know, travel is a very exciting place to be. It's a great place. People really want what you're offering. Uh, so it's a very exciting part of it. But with that comes some quite interesting capabilities. So um, it sometimes feels like, and this is me a few years ago. Uh, I hope you like my dress sense. Um, it feels like you know, you'll learn to walk often in this space. So I think uh, you know, we were formed about two and a half years ago as a data science group. Uh, and it's felt very much like learning to walk as part of that. I think we're now in maybe the toddler phase where we're sort of uh, scrambling around, generally walking a bit, but are still falling over a few times. Um, and hopefully, we can move to uh, this sort of scene where everything's is working very nicely. Have the odd mountain to climb, but it's very nice. So how have we been thinking about this? Um, for me, one of the most crucial things that I think has been part of the learning I've made in the last two and a half years, and I think where we're going in the future, is how to bring cross-functional groups together. So I use the analogy you can see on the right-hand side. Data science and machine learning groups tend to be the yappy dog on the shire horse or the horsepower of engineering. Um, the two have to work symbiotically to win. Um, if you throw in then the key of actually then how to deploy your models, so a great model is only a model when actually your stakeholders are benefiting, whether they're customers, um, partners, um, but ultimately, it's ultimately you, you work together and have a nice group hug. So it's really crucial how you bring those teams together uh, cross-functionally. Um, the other crucial thing I would say is having senior level support is very valuable. Uh, so that's Mr. Diller, our chairman, uh, and um, our CEO in particular, is a great supporter of machine learning and sees it as a fundamental part of our future. Uh, that's very powerful, A, for funding, but B, just that wider support. And at uh, Hotels.com, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, we were founded over um, 25 years ago now, really we've turned, start off with, we turned the screen around to make pricing transparent to the customer. Previously, if you went to a travel agent, they had all the information, you had very little, uh, it was a very asymmetrical relationship. So we first of all turned the screen around and offered price transparency to everybody, which is very powerful. The second thing then, which I think is the next revolution in travel, is the green screen is going to get turned around even more, where we actually have you to navigate the complexity of travel. There are, so there are billions of options, uh, both whether it's air, whether it's hotel, car, activities, putting those all together to make the great trip. There are billions of options now available to you. And our job is helping you find the right one for you. Uh, and we don't sleep until that's happened. So that's a little bit about the strategy. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about the, uh, the technology. So for me, the most exciting thing is the fact that technology is innovating and is dynamic. It never sleeps. And I love the fact that it's all competing against each other. And that's really driving up the innovation for me. Um, even, you know, I think 18 months ago, we started work on our new, on various platforms and partnering with Databricks on their you know, unified analytics platform. And even now, things have changed. You know, as I look back over the last you know, six, year, six months, um, our platform has evolved tremendously since then. You know, we've been 100% cloud for nearly a year. Blimey. Is that better? Ah, okay. 
Uh, we've been 100% cloud now for the last uh, year, and that's been part of our success, I think, in offering that flexible technology. So just to walk through this, on the left, we use the Databricks platform very extensively for model evaluation, data processing. Uh, we run now every job as a cluster, spin it up, spin it straight back down again. And a lot of those legacy challenges then go away in that model. In the middle there, we have a, an engineer cluster capability with Spark at the core on top of Amazon. And we also use some of the technologies, Airflow, uh, RStudio, et cetera. But the fundamentally is, uh, I hope my team would agree with me, I don't ever say to the team, you have to have this platform. They use whichever platform they think makes sense. Um, and that's been a, bit, a big vote of these two winning. And I put on there, you know, for me, the world never ends. You know, this, this dynamic change in the marketplace is constantly changing. So whether it's Google, uh, some of the announcements from Mate this morning, and more to come, um, I just love the innovation that's happening. But just to show a little bit about what we do with Databricks, um, as I said, it's been a key asset for us going forwards. And really, um, whether you're in data engineering, software engineering, data science, machine learning, whatever these, this, this landscape that starts and ends, the key is about productivity and efficiency. I want my team focused on helping customers, not trying to deal with infrastructure and issues and scale. Um, and that's been a great part of the, the capability this has brought for us. Um, it's really helped them to scale and, and, and grow. And it makes the life cycle so much easier to use. Um, you can see there uh, both the reliability and security. And this is a real data. So this is our October usage. I thought I'd share. Um, and you can see there how, A, at weekends, you can hit down to zero. So you can turn off all your cost. And then you can see there that's 1,132 core boxes. It's about 36,000 cores for one spike. So it allows it to be really elastic, really flexible, uh, and that's a key thing. Um, if you went to a C CFO and said, I need 1,100 boxes for one hour this month, you might struggle. So this is a, a key thing of bringing both the cloud and the tooling together. Um, this to me is, I think, a, a really crucial thing I found over the last couple of years. So this, I think, is the hidden secret of data, data engineering, data science, where the vast majority of the time of your data scientists is going in everything else other than machine learning and training models. There's huge amounts of effort in data engineering. This is a chart from Google. There's another chart there. Uh, I think these are pretty typical. For me, as a, as a leader of data science, uh, and in general, if I can bring the amount of time the team has to spend on all those other boxes, down, so that that little section in the middle becomes bigger, if that's 5 to 10% of their time, it should never be zero, but if it's about 60 to 60% 60 feels about right for me, that's a 3 to 4x improvement in time for training and choosing models. If you then bring that together with some of the advances of like auto, uh, auto ML, auto machine learning, where you can really start looking at hyperparameter optimization, and alternative uh, algorithm selection models, you put those two together, and this transforms how machine learning is going to work in the future. Another part of I think of the tech, um, I just this little video, so there's our Captain Obvious character, is we call it Alps, hence the mountain scene, which is our algorithmic lifecycle pipeline service. Um, somehow I think the initials fitted the, the, uh, the analogy. Anyway. I think it's about how do you create an end-to-end -end ML platform. So it's not just I bring together lots of individual components that never work together, and you have a lot of engineering between those components. It's how do I become seamless across them all. And this has been our sort of large focus for, the, for most of this year, actually. So for me, there's really four components that I'd like to be seamless. How do we capture data in marketing, the site, or the app? How do I pipeline it across? Feature engineering, data engineering. Um, I think typically, I mean, most organizations will think this was true, that data engineering groups are focused on uh, third normal design, how to create dimensional data sets for analytics. Whereas in machine learning, different data is needed. So one of my uh, things I would implore everyone to take account of and to prioritize is how to create data sets that empower machine learning. That's one thing we're doing internally inside the company. 
I think all companies will benefit from this. Then you have your machine learning training pipeline. So right now, uh, we're using extensively Spark across all of that pipeline and Databricks. Um, but that really helps derive the innovation. And the final area where I think um, the software community is a little bit, uh, uh, has a big, bigger gap there, is around how to deploy. So you create all this great technology, the data comes in, you fill the gap around in machine learning, but it tends to be quite an effort to put these models into production. Large amounts of engineering team, dependencies, lifecycle deployments. There is some technology out there starting to appear, um, but this feels to me a kind of a, such a large opportunity for all of us to get better. And you can see at the bottom there, the life cycle, um, in my view, how these things all fit together, and particularly how you start streaming real-time data into the live site, so not just batch data. So as Matteo was talking about how you have um, streaming and batch together, I think as these things start to flow through, this becomes a really exciting architecture. Um, you know, one of the things internally uh, from the data engineering ETL group, so this is the group who look after all of our platinum data sets, all the major data sets that power the business, call it the grand truth if you were. They've been testing using Spark uh, instead of say Hive or Tez or other uh, Hadoop based ETL technologies and we've seen a between two and four X improvements in performance and throughput and speed by using that technology. And we've now built, and you see on the top left there, actually a streaming capability. So the, engine, the life site engineers can very easily uh, publish data to this highway, and that sends it through both Kafka and Spark into our environment. So data scientists and other users can get at this data very speedily. And this is going to be, I think, a uh, sort of transformatory capability for us in the future. So that's a little bit of the technology. Happy to share more offline uh, if anybody is interested. Um, but I thought I'd share a little bit more of the use cases. So um, I had a couple of examples which I think are quite exciting. One of them is in the deep learning space. So you saw I think, a bit of a demo earlier. Um, in travel, the hotel image is incredibly powerful. If you think about your own shopping, the image is very powerful at A, which hotels do I shortlist? And ultimately convincing you that's the right hotel for you. On top of that, we have millions of photos from the hotels. We also now have hundreds of thousands and growing fast by the day of photos from fellow users and consumers. So that's a really critical authenticity point you can actually see a photo taken by somebody who stayed in that room or in that hotel. Um, it's going to revolutionize uh, to photos what reviews have already done in the marketplace. And you can see there that chart. The challenge with photos is they offer um, some uh, machine learning and understanding challenges. So we have some big use cases, how to assess image quality. So near dupe detection, how good is an image? Uh, how do you assess that image quality programmatically? How do we classify the various scenes we have? And how do we rank the various images we have? Um, if you think you're using a mobile device, so over half of our customers are now using mobile smartphones, the amount of bandwidth going through hundreds of photos is huge. And most customers won't wait that long. So it's really crucial we surface up the best imagery for you, um, particularly mobile. So just to give you a little example of what I mean, Top left there, you can see, maybe you might agree with me, that's quite a nice image. Um, you know, that might be quite attractive. Nice little swimming pool there, some nice fish. That's quite a relaxing image. Top right, uh, a couple of images that we've had on our site in the, in the mid to long past, where maybe they're less useful to a user. Uh, we had a chicken, and maybe that photo there is, well, maybe useful, maybe not. But for uh, 200 pounds for the stay, you might wonder why am I paying 200 pounds for that kind of hotel. And also with user photos, sometimes you have challenges. So we ask the users to tag their own photo. Sometimes you have challenges where that was a real example. Uh, you know, the edge cases start to become the norm when you start having user uh, tagging involved. So how do you solve this? Um, I think there's a lot of well-trailed material out there around using deep learning and convolutional neural network approaches. Um, but practically, this is where this gets really interesting, using, particularly using Spark um, and Databricks and TensorFlow. So 
you need to do a large amount of experimentation to make these things work. Uh, as you can see there, um, if we just used you know, a reasonably large CPU cluster for a couple hundred thousand images, it would take 500 days to process, which is not feasible in any commercial context. Even when you start deploying more GPUs and really start optimizing what you do, you can start to bring that down to four days per run. That's not a very fast uh, life cycle and loop. Even when you get even better, so the four days was an estimate. When we actually looked at the real data and ran it, it took 15 days to run. Um, which after some extra work, we managed to get down to two and a half days. So it's still two and a half days per run for 200,000 images. And we have over 12 million on the site. So these productivity and sort of reliability challenges have been something that we've been working with Databricks pretty extensively in the Spark community on, uh, and also the Keras community. We've now got this down to about three to four hours by clustering GPU clusters, which creates quite a, a technical challenge, um, but it's a very powerful one for our users. So just to give you an example, um, these are real examples. Um, sometimes it can be difficult you know, to a user if a duplicate looks pretty similar. So on the right there, you can see there's a zoomed in photo. The bottom is quite an interesting one. The curtains are open and closed. So it's a customer that probably doesn't offer that much extra value. Uh, where on the left-hand side, those are very different rooms. So they do offer value. So being able to do that programmatically across the hundreds of thousands of properties we have on our site is really crucial. The other part is then the, the scene classification problem. So how do I figure out which is the most interesting, you know, A, what is in the photo, both at an overall level, how do I create an emotional context with a customer? I can list, was there a desk, was there a TV? You know, that's more of a solved problem using Google and other things. But this adds the context of our use case, which is really important for users. I think one of the big things we found is if you use the base APIs, you get an okay value, maybe mid-80s accuracy. If you then use your own domain information on top, that gets you to 99.9% .9 accuracy. So it's really crucial to use your own data. Don't just rely on the APIs out there for most use cases. Uh, for those that know it, fundamentally took a lot of work, but that's a pretty good confusion matrix. Ideally, you want all the blue on the diagonal, uh, no blue elsewhere. And then you have the interesting thing around how do I order the photos? Uh, what makes sense? Um, what is the right order for different use cases? If I'm traveling with my family versus traveling on business, the types of photos I need for me ideally need to be personalized, which is pretty crucial. And that's been an area we've been focused on. The second big use case we use Spark for is really why we exist as a company. My fundamental job is to find the right hotel for you at the best price. Uh, and this is what we call our search listing uh, or marketplace. So there are many, many signals to feed into the underlying model in real time um, to go to select what's the best order for you. Um, and we use a conversion probability to find that number, whether it's the geography, the image, the price, the location, the deal, the reviews. For different users, we have to personalize this. And particularly, as we move to more of a matrix factorization approach, the complexity is rising. That increases the value, but it creates more technology challenges how we solve it. You know, just to give you an example of why this is really important, this is real data from um, real cu different customer segments in London, and these are heat maps of where they'd like to stay. So you can see there, there's quite a big sort of East London presence. And West London presence, this is a bit more of a value uh, approach segment. This segment is a little bit more business focused, so more of the Eastern piece. There you can see there's a big Heathrow component. So you can see very clearly how different customers want to stay in different parts of the city. The other big one that really spark and the technologies help empower, traditionally, you can only have enough compute power for doing modeling using order data, transactional data. Now, with the, with the power in the last couple of years we can use Spark for, we're now able to take signals from both intent and browsing and personalization to bring that together into a much better experience, a more relevant experience, that when you A-B test the difference between the two models, you get orders of magnitude business value. 
that's ultimately the ultimate um, key we're trying to achieve. So with that, I uh, hope this is very useful for you. Uh, I'm looking forward to um, chatting offline. So I'm Matt Fryer from Hotels.com, and thank you.